California, I thought I went to America to go and attend the big PyCon over there, and just as I left there, announced the conference over here. And I was so sad I missed it, but I'm very happy to be here uh, this year. Um, so I hope you'll forgive the, um, the lack of magenta over here. It's a little bit hard to give an image processing talk with one color missing, uh, but we will see what we can do. Um, so just uh, use your imagination. No, don't just pretend you're uh, not colorblind. All right, so um, this talk will be about scikit image. Uh, scikit image is an image processing toolbox uh, written for the sci-fi ecosystem. So image processing is typically uh, seen as the art of manipulating images like you would do, for example, in Photoshop. But we think about it more as uh, the way we interpret images with computers so that we can gain some understanding from the composition of the image. So uh, this toolbox is aimed primarily at, uh, at scientific use. And uh, it's meant to be used inside the SciPy ecosystem. So I don't know if many of you are familiar with that uh, ecosystem, but uh, it would include packages like NumPy. Everything's built on NumPy, a basic uh, array library. Uh, on top of Num uh, NumPy, we've got SciPy, which is a set of scientific uh, Python tools. And, um, and scikit-image also relies on Scython. So Scython is a compiled, essentially compiled version of Python that allows us to get a lot of speed uh, while still maintaining uh, a high-level language. So this package is, uh, is mainly aimed at three, for, uh, for three different things. Uh, we want to do reproducible image processing research, not just image processing research maybe, but uh, research in general uh, pertaining to data organized on a grid. Um, but the idea that at least when you build your uh, scientific application, that every part of that um, application can be inspected uh, and verified and um, understood. So there are numerous other image processing tools out there, and some of them are very good. You may be familiar with uh, OpenCV, for example. Very good library, very fast, um, but not what I would call extremely Pythonic necessarily, uh, not necessarily um, a, a tool that fits in very well with the current uh, SciPy ecosystem. Then uh, we are trying to, uh, to write a wide base of algorithms uh, so that these algorithms could become useful in, in industry um, and also just uh, produce a library that can be used for quickly evaluating whether an algorithm works or not uh, without having to write a bunch of uh, you know hardcore C code. And then finally uh, I'm I lecture at the at Stellenbosch University in applied mathematics and this tool is also aimed at teaching my students uh, how image processing fits together. So the whole idea is that the code is written in such a way that students can understand the code, modify the code, use the code. So to give you a, a bit of further insight into what image processing typically does, uh, here's one example of many. I took a camera and I aimed it at the wall. I had a wall clock on there. And um, excuse me, could you turn on the mic a little bit? Um, so I've got the, amera, uh, the camera aimed at the wall with a clock on it. And I'm sweeping the camera as I'm pushing the shutter. So that introduces this uh, motion blur. And the, time, uh, the, the question you ask yourself then is, can I tell the time from this picture? So is that information somehow located in that image? Or is it completely lost? So, so if you model the underlying process, then theoretically you should be able to invert that process. So if we know the image has been blurred, we should be able to de-blur it somehow, um, unless the information has been destroyed. So here's a little application I wrote in scikit-image that allows me to, uh, to do a deep blur and play around a little bit with the parameters. And uh, I happen to know what the magic parameter is here. I've played around with it a little bit before. Uh, you can adjust the exposure time. It doesn't make a big difference over here. Um, 
but the real parameter you want to mess around with here is A, which uh, describes the motion in the X direction. So if you drag that one over here, then you should see something interesting happening. Right, so around 0 0.04, we start seeing something come out of that image. I don't know how clear it is on the projector for you guys, but you can start seeing numbers appear here on the side, and you see that dark line over there? And here's another dark line over here. So the hands of the clock start to appear, and you can extract the, the time from the watch. So that, that's about 20 past one, I think. So when I saw this example, it, uh, it was really striking to me because it, it made me realize that there's so much more hidden in data than can necessarily be observed by the human eye. And the human brain is an absolutely fascinating thing. I mean, it's a, the, our image processing engine or our signal processing engine inside the mind is probably one of the uh, most complex and, and uh, <coughs> powerful uh, machines imaginable. And yet in this image here that I'd like to investigate. So Psychic Image was, uh, it, it was started in around 2009 as I worked towards my PhD. It was, uh, it was just a set of tools that I developed uh, while I worked on a problem called super resolution imaging. Um, so super resolution imaging is where uh, you've got an object that's pretty far away. You can't identify the object. So for example, you've got a person, the person's too far away to identify his or her face. Um, so what do you do? Well. Typically, you put a better lens on your camera, but imagine you don't have that option. So imagine you're in the situation where um, you've got a rover that you send off to Mars, for example, and then you decide you need high resolution images. But you can't change the lens on the rover all of a sudden. So what do you do? Well, you acquire multiple images of the landscape, and um, you rotate or move the camera in some way while you take those pictures and then you combine all those pictures together to form a single higher resolution image. But in order to do that you need a fairly sophisticated image processing pipeline because uh, you need to handle the image acquisition, you need to handle the registration or the alignment of the different photos. Um, then you need to find a way of combining all of these photos so that's typically done by um, inverting a linear algebra problem and then finally you get to your super resolution uh, solution. So your typical input data looks like this. So that's a, that's a little video shot at the uh, library of Surrey and I'm just repeating the, the, the clip over there but you can see it's a very short clip. It's only about uh, 30, 30 frames in that clip and what I would like to know is what is the name of the building over there? And the results we obtain look something like this. So you can see that the top frame is, the, is one of the 30 input frames, um, just blown up a little bit. Then the second frame is where we take all of those images and we align them together and we add them together. So that reduces a whole bunch of noise and you get this very smooth image, but it doesn't yet contain um, the information you seek. And then finally, when you do this super resolution reconstruction, then you see the text very clearly here and there, you can see that this is the George Edwards Library. Now, actually, if you look carefully, you will see something else appear. Do you see this slightly uh, oscillatory pattern in the background? Those are the bricks on the wall. So this started off as a bit of a pet project. People started posting um, snippets on the mailing list and uh, as I saw repeated snippets there, I thought, well, maybe it would be useful to combine these, th these things together. So it was mostly a, 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 an issue of convenience. Um, and initially, the project, well, it, it, it was only me. And uh, around version 0 0.3, um, Chris Colbert, who now works at Enthought, he joined in. And he wrote our OpenCV wrappers. So Psychic Image originally started as basically one massive OpenCV wrapper. That wrapper no longer exists. Uh, OpenCV now, uh, now has their own uh, Python wrappers, but back then their Python wrapper copied data and it was horrible, so we had to, uh, had to wrap it. Um, but now we've completely thrown out that piece of code, but that's at least where uh, Scikit Image started. So um, you can see that we've had steady growth over the years. Um, 
And if you were to annotate this graph with a few of my life events, you would see some correlations. So for example, um, the project started out when I was simply bored on a Saturday and I, I wrote some code, put it in there. Um, but then of course I had a PhD to finish, so an incredible amount of effort went in right before that deadline. Uh, then I discovered that wasn't the real deadline, I actually had a little bit more time and so I actually put that into my PhD so nothing happened for a while. Started a postdoc, lots of free time until I again realized there was a real world deadline and then uh, efforts stopped for a little bit. Um, but since then the project has been growing fairly sustainably because now uh, we've got multiple other developers on the project. Um, but of course, uh, in real life, I think what's going on here is that uh, every black line you see, every purple line on my screen, um, is, a, is a release of Psychic Image. And just before the release, people get quite excited to get their personal favorite feature in. And then you see a lot of uh, activity uh, in, the, in the pull request. So we run the, image, uh, we, we run the uh, project development on GitHub. And uh, we found that this completely changed the game. The conversation that you can have there, we sometimes have a two month or three month discussions on a single pull request, going to and fro about, uh, about API design decisions, um, just reviewing and commenting and discussing. And um, it just, it raised the quality of code uh, tremendously. <coughs> From Olo, I pulled down a summary of the project. So currently, we've got about 88 con contributors. Uh, they're not full-time contributors, but they have contributed in the past, um, and about 25,000 lines of code. So it's not a massive project. Um, but a lot of this code is written in, um, in Cython as well. So when, when I show this graph that shows the different languages, it's not unsurprising that there's only one language, but it's essentially Python and, uh, and Cython. And um, yes, I, I think it's uh, the fact that they say that we've got increasing year-over-year -year commits and that we've got a large sustainable development team. Those are all signs of a, of a healthy project. So like I said, we've got essentially uh, three goals to produce uh, reproducible uh, soft or software for reproducible research. Uh, to, to help industry with some applications and um, then to do education. So just an example of each of those. I'm currently working on a shark fin analysis uh, project. So a few months ago, a biologist walked into my office and said, uh, I would like you to help me identify some sharks. Now, I get strange requests from students quite often, but this one uh, was even stranger than usual. usual. But she then uh, explained to me that they go out on the ocean and then uh, they, they have a camera and then they chum the water a little bit and they get these massive great whites to jump out of the water and they, uh, they photograph the sharks. And what they then want to do is they want to take, uh, take the data and figure out when did I see this individual? Did I see him the next week again? Uh, which area did he come from? Where did he end up and that sort of thing? So they want to track the sharks figure out the dynamics, the, the family interactions, etc. Um, they do something else as well. They've got a postdoc on that uh, boat, and he's got a stick about this long. And he has got the privilege of sampling the DNA of the shark. <laughs> so he gets to hang over the side and wait for the right moment. It's a delicate process. And they just you know, stab the shark at the right moment just to get a little bit of, of DNA. Um, so they have that in their database as well. Um, so what they give to us is just, is a, uh, is just a large collection of photos uh, and the date on which the photo was taken. And what they want to know is uh, which photo belongs to which individual and what date was it seen, etc. cetera. Um, so how would you do that? Well, it turns out that the shark's back fin is, is like a fingerprint. That, uh, that, that back side of the fin, that pattern <coughs> is, is completely unique to each shark. And if you can identify the position of that, of that pattern, uh, you could potentially match it up to the, other, to the other shark's patterns and identify the individuals. So here I've sketched out the typical pipeline we would do. Um, so we get the shark images in. We figure out, is the shark swimming to the left or to the right? Uh, we segment out the fin so that we know where the fin is inside the image. 
then you detect the flint, um, you compare all the flints together, which is a little bit of a tricky process because the shaft could have swam to the side or it could be rotated a little bit. Um, the, the camera could have been closer, away, uh, closer or further away, so you have to compensate for the length. Uh, so we use something like dynamic time warping to compare the flints, and it, in the end we give them a clustering of all the different shafts out. But in the end of the day, what we really want to do is we want to develop uh, insight and uh, do real science about what is fundamentally going on uh, inside of nature. So you'll see from the previous example as well from super resolution that uh, we deal with a lot of pipelines. And this was one of my major gripes with the existing Python tools is that there were so many tools available, but they didn't plug in together nicely. And with scikit image, what we try and do is make it just work. So if you take five different algorithms and you just plug them together, data must just flow. Uh, it might seem like a, like a trivial challenge, but it turns out there are numerous ways of representing images. For example, people use floating point numbers between 0 and 1, or uh, integers between 0 and 255 in different ranges and types and so forth. So it, it can get a bit tricky. Here's an example then of uh, two of the steps in that pipeline. So we use a, a grow cut algorithm to segment out the fin um, after you place a few markers. Um, and then you have to identify the exact location of the, uh, of the back, back side of the fin. So we do some edge detection on the fin and then we uh, use shortest path algorithms to locate its uh, exact position. Here's an example from industry. So um, Juan Iglesias needed to do some chromosome segmentation. And he sent me this picture. Uh, again, it looks like it should be quite straightforward. Your eye immediately knows what to do with that image. But surprisingly, if you do a local thresholding algorithm on that image, you see something like this. So why does that happen? Well, it turns out that the background of that image has got a soft gradient that runs over it. Um, so it works very well for the areas in which you have chromosomes, uh, but gets very confused around the rest of the image. And the key insight you have to make there is that um, where you have only background, the image is very granular. So you can use morphological operations to just clean it up a bit, and uh, this is the typical result you would get. So I briefly showed you, I'll just skip over this because you've seen this already, but with the, uh, with the clock de-blurring example, we decided to build some very uh, basic uh, graphical user interface tools into Scikit Image. Uh, this is not our domain of expertise, so we didn't want to go in there too deeply, but it is very handy to just uh, be able to write four lines of code and have your image pop up and be able to draw some sliders to adjust your filters. So we have some very simple tools uh, for doing this sort of thing and for doing uh, comparisons. Um, Maybe I can just show you that, for example, uh, yeah, okay, I'll skip that for now. Um, on, the educate, uh, on the education side, like I said, the code is, is entirely open. It is well documented. We make a point out of uh, illustrating each piece of code with a gallery example. So if you go to the, uh, the Scikit image website, then, oh dear. Uh. Ah. So there's the Psychic Image website, and at the top you'll see um, there's a gallery. So if you go into the gallery, uh, my internet connection is down at the moment. But if you go to the gallery, you get all these different examples. Um, and if you click on any of the examples, for example, here's the template matching example, then you see the output of the example and the snippet of code that, uh, that produced the example. In most of the examples, you'll see that most of the code um, is mainly for plotting purposes, and then the algorithm is, is typically a fairly short part. So we've got um, some examples that you can look at. Uh, we've got template matching, skeletonization, uh, pyramid construction, if you're into uh, biological slides, you can do your staining, some contour finding, and you've got back projection using the, um, the radon transform. Yeah. 
So apart from that, uh, we also interact with the people at Software Carpentry. Software Carpentry is a group uh, aimed at, at uh, instructing and teaching so, uh, software engineering uh, using Python. So for them, we've built a module into Scikit Image called uh, scikitimage.novice, um, and that allows you to, it, it has this powerful image object that allows you to um, just uh, you know, describe an image of the pixels in terms of uh, words that would occur in natural language. So if you say pixel.red, um, a beginner typically understand what that means. You're not going to use that once you're an expert, but it's convenient for beginners to be able to just run over the pixels and based on some criterion, uh, change the color uh, or move it around, that sort of thing. So we built this very simple interface where um, younger people or beginners in programming can start to play around with images. It's not fast, but it, it, it works. We've been fortunate enough to have three Google Summer of Code students this year. And uh, they've been working on image segmentation, on uh, image inpainting. So if you've got scratches on a photo and you want to fill in, if you want to uh, remove those scratches, how would you fill it in? And then finally on uh, feature matching, which is a, a core component of image uh, alignment. So here's an example where um, we do orb matching. Orb is a type of feature. And um, oh, wow, that looks really grim without the purple. Um, but that espresso looks quite appetizing on my screen, at least. Um, so you can see at least the basic idea there that uh, we locate key points and we match them to the target image. Here's another example with uh, Lena. Um, at, the, uh, at the last sprints we had at the American Sci-Fi Conference, I worked with Stuart Mumford uh, on, he's, he's part of the, uh, What's it called? The SunPy project, yes. So they do all sorts of simulations pertaining to the sun and to solar weather. And one of the things they wanted to do is they've got good models for how the sun uh, rotates itself or, or gets rotated over, um, over time. And say I give you an input image of the sun, the way it looks right now, can I predict how it's going to look in a few hours from now? So I worked with him and this is the result that we got. So this is the only input data we've got is the image and then SunPy can calculate for you where would each position on the sun be in a few hours from now. So you can see what happens. Um, these values over here, they're all blurred because they're actually behind the sun at the moment and they're not being dragged into view. So we've got no data about this. But these values over here, they look pretty good because we know they come from there, but they've not shifted over there. So we just push them, and push them into that uh, region of the image. Now all these tools, essentially, um, the warping tools are all available in SciPy, but we've got uh, very simple interfaces for working with them. So doing this is literally about five lines of code. You just need to sp uh, specify how you're going to, to um, move each, each pixel, and scikit-image does the rest, rest of the work for you. So here's an example. Um, there's Lena, and you can see I warped her face a little bit, so I just did a fisheye transform on that. Um, and that is as simple as, there's the, there's the whole code. So literally, you import the libraries, you define your transformation function, um, and then you ask like an image to move all the coordinates for you. Right, so um, where's all of this going? Well, I think in the future, a lot, of a lot of image processing is going to happen on the graph domain. So things are moving from a regular grid images onto data sampled in three dimensions, <coughs> higher dimensions, and also on irregular grids. Um, and uh, this is something I, I saw a lot when I worked with, uh, with brain data recently. So we'll watch that space and see, see what happens over there. But graph-based <coughs> algorithms, definitely something to, to watch. Then, um, just to finish off with, uh, recently I got an email from a colleague from mine from Singapore, and he told me, uh, I found Scikit Image quite useful, and uh, I expected to hear something about one of his academic endeavors, but instead, he showed me the following video. <laughs> I 
I don't know how many of you uh, recognize that. It's a game called Super Hexagon. It's pretty tricky to play, so the idea is that uh, you are the little dot here in the middle, and then you get attacked from all sides by these uh, boundaries, and then you have to move yourself so that you don't get caught by the boundaries. He then um, he used those, that warp functionality to warp the um, to warp the image. So um, take it from a circular coordinate system by a rectangular one, and then he just does a um, uses a shortest pass algorithm to find his way out of that space. <laughs> Show you another example. There is another example playing on an actual computer. He used to have a, a tablet with actuators, so he had little thumbs that went. <laughs> 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 then he said that became um, that, that didn't work so well after a while. So uh, especially when things got fast. So uh, now he's just playing it all on the computer. Right. So that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for your attention. Um, <laughs>I wish I could give you a better answer, but it was almost by chance, I guess, because um, I remember that about two years ago, I was on the verge of saying, you know, should I cancel the project? Should I go ahead with this? Um, and I think with most of these things, it's, you know, the curve is def definitely not linear. You sort of, you see a little bit of pickup. The moment you've got a bit of pickup, then other people pick up on it and you sort of see this uh, exponential growth. Uh, so you must get people to buy in but how do they buy in if there's nothing there? So you have this bit of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, so I guess for me, because it was something that, uh, that I loved doing and because I, I put enough of my own energy in there, eventually we had enough to, to start it off and then it just became a runaway uh, um, you know, process. So at the moment, uh, even if I'm gone for months at a time, the last two releases happened without me, which made me very happy. Um, so I'm, I, can, I can safely now withdraw from the project and I'm pretty sure it will, it will continue by itself. Um, but I think it's just the hard bit is getting through that initial, um, that initial time when, there's, when it's just you and when you have to push until enough people get involved.